Warhammer 40k is a game that has a ton of armies, like almost too many, and it can be daunting to research them and tough to keep track of which ones do which. So today we're going to break them all down and talk about exactly how they play on the tabletop. And if you're looking for someone to play them with, I'm happy to announce that this video is sponsored by a new social media app for tabletop gamers to find other gamers, Voxlink, that I'll talk about later on in the video. What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and welcome to a rapid-fire overview of every single faction in Warhammer 40k and an overview of how they play on the table. I've actually done one of these in the past, but it's been a long time since the last one, and most of these codexes have been updated, so they have different mechanics, and I think it's time to revisit them. Each army is just going to get a brief overview in this video, but if you want to see example lists for what each army typically brings to the table, I do have a video for that that I released recently that I'll link down in the video description. The purpose of this video is mostly gonna be for new 40K players and people just getting into the hobby to familiarize them with each army and give them an idea of what they might be up against. Now I'm gonna be breaking everything down by factions, super factions, and sub factions, and I'll give a brief overview of what all that weird nomenclature means. A faction is essentially just an army or a codex. It refers to the faction keyword that your detachment uses. A super faction is a collection of factions. This is usually things like the Imperium of Man, Forces of Chaos, Tyranids. Those are all super factions and they share a keyword, but you can't build specific detachments based on that keyword. However, you can ally different detachments of armies that share that keyword together. A sub-faction is a division of the faction. So you can think of something like a Space Marine chapter where you would be playing the Space Marine army, but there are several varieties of Space Marine that you could be playing that all exist within one codex. As always, if you enjoy my 40K content, remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, do all that YouTube stuff. I really appreciate it. Now let's talk for a moment about our sponsor, Voxlink. If you're watching this video right now, you and I probably have something very important in common. We both spend way too much time on YouTube. We both like playing miniatures games, but there's one special secret ingredient that miniatures games need to be absolutely great, an opponent. But those can be hard to come by if you're playing in a new location, new to the community, or maybe just move to a new area, which is why I'm happy to talk to you about Voxlink. Voxlink is a new community building app designed by tabletop gamers, for tabletop gamers. This new app is live on Kickstarter as we speak and will allow you to post up that you're looking for a game and the type of game that you're looking to play and allow others to find and message you based on proximity. You'll also be able to use it to find new play groups, register for organized play events, communicate with local players, and even get notified about new content from your favorite content creators. Really, it's a wholesale social media app designed explicitly for tabletop gamers of all varieties, including those playing miniature games like Warhammer 40K. At launch, the Voxlink app is gonna be free, but you can join as a premium member. And if you jump on the Kickstarter today, you can get enormous discounts on your premium membership. Premium membership is gonna unlock some special abilities like event publishing and bracketing, 5% off purchases with brands such as Magnet Baron, Baron of Dice, and Dicehead Games, exclusive content on the app, and a verified badge, as well as exclusive beta access to the app and all of its features. Getting established in any new community is always hard, and especially so for the tabletop gaming community, which is why we need a tool like Voxlink to link players together. I see what you did there. Thanks to Voxlink for sponsoring the video, and let's dive right in. First, starting with the miscellaneous Xenos factions. Now, these are actually factions that do not have a super faction. We consider them the unaligned factions. They don't actually have the unaligned keyword. Uh, that's a different thing within the game that it allows you to take units across factions that are, you know, mercenaries and neutral, neutral units and things like that. But uh, these factions do not have a super faction. They're all just independent. We'll start first with the newest faction in the game, the newly added Leagues of Votan that were released towards the end of last year. These are Nordic space dwarves lifted directly from the annals of Deep Rock Galactic. Rock and stone! They're not really Xenos, but actually an unaligned species of Ab that isn't technically part of the Imperium and is actually kind of heretical, but does work very closely with them, as evidenced by the fact that they can actually be taken as allies alongside Imperium 
of units in some formats, such as the Arcs of Omen Grand Tournament format. The army is a solid all-rounder, but has a primary focus on survivability and ranged damage output. They're one of the tankier armies in the game, but they lack speed on many of their units outside their fast attack options, and have limited psychic options both offensively and defensively. Against Leagues of Votan, over the course of the game, enemy units accrue judgment tokens from Votan characters, or when they just generically do things that the dwarves don't like. Each of those tokens stack a permanent attack bonus for any Votan units attacking them, meaning that a Votan army will do significantly more damage at the end of the game than it would be at the beginning. Necrons are robot skeleton men hailing from a time long past the action sci-fi movies of the 1980s. I'll be back. They pre-program their troops with command protocols that give them useful abilities throughout the game. And while they generally have relatively slow and bricky infantry that are reliant on stacking defensive effects to try to survive enemy alpha strikes, they can also be supported by fast and cheap beast units, swarms, and bikers all of which with some movement shenanigans to reposition them, including pre-game moves and redeploys to teleport them around the table. They're all a kind of annoying to kill thanks to their reanimation protocols ability, allowing them to potentially come back to life or be repaired if you ever fail to kill their units. And they're very good at stealing away objectives and scoring victory points with objective secured effects and a brace of very strong secondary objectives. Necron armies can be supported by Catan shards, which are powerful melee meters that also behave kind of like psychers with extra steps. They have the ability to deal a lot of mortal wounds with damage powers that work like psychic powers, but not actually being psychers means that a lot of anti-psyker defense cannot stop them. Necrons have a lot of interesting and very competitive builds available, from both hordes of infantry to super heavy vehicle bricks, and versions in between that focus on more elite infantry. Orcs are the most terrifying and obnoxious foe the galaxy has ever seen. Rabid football fans. No, no, no. They are super aggressively oriented. Their warlord is able to call the wah once per game to give a surge of huge benefits either to ranged or melee units, depending on the style of warlord your army has. And if it's Gazgol or Akthraka, the biggest orc in the galaxy himself, you actually get both. This faction's able to upgrade individual units with custom job and mob abilities, and their armies are typically numerous and pretty hard hitting, especially in melee, but not too survivable. Usually focused on delivering a huge alpha strike to their opponent with ranged weapons for mass vehicles or melee troops that are able to get to the middle of the table protected by powerful transports. Once they get stuck into the enemy, they can do massive damage in melee and steal your objectives and trade with very efficient melee units. The Tau of the Tau Empire are high-tech space communists governed by the Ethereals, a mysterious cast of mind controllers, glorious and wise leaders whose counsel is always correct. This is one of the most mobile and strongest shooting armies in the game. While they entirely lack psychers and almost all melee ability, the ability of a Tau army to shoot their opponent full of tiny holes is almost unparalleled. With quantity having a quality all its own, they can feed alien auxiliary units or lower cast members into the meat grinder to buy time for their insane gun line to do damage. This gun line is usually formed from a core of battlesuit units that carry enormous mobility and firepower with the ability to redeploy themselves, deep strike during the game, and get enormous movement buffs. All of this is fueled by tactical philosophies, a buff that they choose to adopt at the beginning of the game, either Montka or Kaoyan that changes the abilities of some of their units and gives them a bonus either at the start or end of the game, respectively. Now we'll move on to Eldari, the resident space elves of the 41st millennium. These factions tend to be unified by a pretty consistent theme. They are fragile, but super fast and have tons of mobility enhancing options, including many ways to move out of phase, extend their movement or threat ranges to alpha strike their opponent. All of the armies in the Eldari super faction tend to be very difficult to play because they're not very resilient outside of a couple specific builds, but they are so technical that they reward very good play. So if you enjoy movement-based play, Eldari may be for you. As your Yanni are the classic space elf boys. They are basically one step away from wearing green and carrying bows and arrows. In fact, one of the relics that's typically seen in competitive play is literally called a bow. The entirety of the faction can move after shooting, making this one extremely difficult to pin down. And they use a unique mechanic called Strands of Fate, 
that allow them to generate automatic results of a six for a random set of dice each round, which encourages all rounder armies that perform well in every phase to make the most use of the strands of fate dice that they may get each turn. The core of the army is composed of unique aspect warrior units that are the faction's strongest combat specialists and let you customize their unit leaders with special relics or purchased abilities for a little sly hero hammer action on the side. They're also in the running for the game's best psychers with tons of options for both spells and good casters. And they combo damage buff and debuff psychic powers with fast melee and strong short range shooting to do absolutely massive damage to their opponent. Now this video actually has a secret special sponsor, Raid Shadow Legend. I'm just kidding, this is actually just the Drukhari section, although I forgive you for confusing the two. Drukhari are the sexy emo dark elves of the 41st millennium. The faction has no psychers to speak of at all, unlike all of the other Eldari sub-factions, which are highly dependent on their psychers, but they gain army-wide special abilities as the game goes on thanks to their Power from Pain ability. These guys are extremely fast and melee-oriented and split into three distinct sub-factions. Cabalites, who are normal guys who shoot guns and behave basically like other Eldari or almost any other chaff unit in another codex. Witches, who are kind of like Harlequins that we'll talk about in the next section, and gain advantages by navigating combat and trapping enemies in melee with them. And last but certainly not least, the Homunculus Covens, who use big, beefy flesh constructs and mutated Hellraiser rejects to be uncharacteristically tanky. Probably the toughest sub-faction of all Eldari. Now, while other armies typically have to choose one sub-faction to use and are excluded from using any other ones, Drukhari can actually bring all of their sub-factions together alongside unaligned Drukhari units called Blades for Hire without losing too many abilities, and they have some special detachment rules to make this possible. This makes Drukhari lists very flexible and pretty diverse, but again, almost entirely melee oriented. Harlequins are literally killer clowns from outer space. Why? Ouch. They are a super fast and dodgy faction, reliant entirely on bikers and cheap flying transports that carry around their mobile infantry, who are individually impossible to pin down thanks to their abilities that allow them to move freely and ignore almost every downside of the movement phase, including penalties that you would normally impose from advancing or falling back. The army uses a unique reroll mechanic called Luck of the Laughing God to generate a number of rerolls each round that they can use every turn, either to survive with their universal faction-wide invulnerable saves, or deal extra damage by rerolling attack dice. They compound this speed and trickiness with an extremely strong selection of damage-dealing characters that are customizable with special pivotal roll upgrades that give them some extra very powerful abilities. Last but potentially least in the Eldari factions are the Yanari. These are nominally an Azure Yanni or Craftworld Eldar army that is eligible to take units from other Eldari sub-factions, notably Drukhar and Harlequins. In exchange, you lose access to some of the core Craftworld units like Phoenix Lords, which are powerful characters, and some of their powerful psychic powers, but unlock a set of melee-focused sub-faction abilities and special powers, as well as a unique trio of special characters called the Triumvirate of Yiniad. The most important of these is the Incarn, a huge melee monster that can teleport around the table anytime any unit from either side is destroyed, making it extremely difficult to pin down if used right. The the result is a close combat focused and highly technical army that is almost unstoppable in the hands of a good player. Now we'll move on to the Forces of the Hive Mind, aka Tyranids. Forces of the Hive Mind is kind of a colloquialism referring to this super faction that the community has come up with. The actual unifying faction keyword that they have is Tyranids, but because one of the codexes is called Codex Tyranids, it gets a little bit confusing. Technically, it's Hive Tendril and Gene Stealer Cult as the two components of the super faction, but a little bit of a shout out to Astra Militarum who can be brung, brought alongside Gene Stealer Cults thanks to their Brood Brothers rules. This faction is very much the horde mode of the game. They rely on large numbers of infantry with a lot of deep striking and movement shenanigans that can kite enemy units, keep them at distance, and trade with them for objectives. In that way, it's kind of similar to Eldari, but their units tend to be less elite and a little bit more chaff. We'll dive into Tyranids by talking about Tyranids proper, although technically these use the Hive Tendril keyword. This is essentially what happens when a Xenomorph from Alien and a Bug 
Shield from Starship Troopers love each other very much. And it's my favorite faction, so it's clearly the best with no bias at all. The army uses powerful synapse creatures to relay its commands around the table and, and bounce buffs between units, making them almost immune to morale and sharing a unique set of army-wide abilities called synaptic imperatives that change from round to round depending on the exempt composition of synapse creatures that you've included in your army. They're a good all-rounder faction with a particular focus on strong psychers and relatively fast movement, and usually use swarms of light infantry that can buy time and steal objectives from enemies until their larger heavy hitting monsters and characters can do the real damage. Gene Stealer cults are what happens before a Tyranid invasion gets to your planet. They are the disenfranchised workers of the Imperium rising up to seize the means of production. And also, some of them have three arms and may look a little bit like Klingons, but definitely don't worry about that part. They have a unique deployment style that lets them choose to reserve large parts of their army or deploy reactively after their opponent's first movement phase, making them extremely difficult to plan against. They deploy large quantities of pretty mediocre light infantry that can catch their opponent off guard with overwhelming strikes out of reserve, supported by a lot of character buffs. This is fueled by the unique crossfire and expose mechanics that grant enormous buffs to their small arms fire when outmaneuvering their opponent, and can often generate these buffs with characters or unique upgrades called proficient plans. Now moving on to the big baddies of the 41st millennium, the Armies of Chaos. These are made up of a lot of independent warbands and individual factions that are sworn to worship of one of the four Chaos gods, either Korn, Slanesh, Zinch, and Nurgle. But there are also a divided factions that follow additional operators like characters like Bellacor. This is a very diverse sub-faction. It has a lot of component parts and the allegiance to different chaos gods actually changes significantly how each faction within it play. A lot of times the faction relies on very intricate combos of abilities to assemble supercharged Death Star units of characters or big beefy bricks, but that's not 100% the case across the entirety of the faction. Chaos Demons are the warp-born servants of the Chaos Gods and are broken into four distinct sub-factions, each with their own units, one for each Chaos God. These can be taken together as an undivided detachment or independently as in a detachment allegiant to one of the Chaos Gods, which unlocks additional abilities for their Warp Storm. This Warp Storm is a unique mechanic that gives a points buy system to army-wide abilities every turn that works sort of like stratagems or abilities that you'll use as you need them. But the points that you get are as fickle as the warp. And while you do have a number of undivided abilities that all demon armies get access to, you only unlock the more powerful god-specific abilities by having detachments entirely allegiant to those gods. In terms of the gods, Korn tends to focus on melee damage output, especially with blood letters and extremely powerful melee characters teleporting out of reserve almost directly into melee. Zinch deals insane ranged damage with relatively short-range guns and psychic powers and is almost impossible to kill with ranged attacks. Slanesh brings lightly armored but super fast melee hordes that are excellent at stealing objectives and scything through enemy infantry while Nurgle focuses entirely on tankiness, enormously defensive stats, and regenerating their models. Every model in the faction has a unique invulnerable save, an unmodifiable save, meaning that even high AP weapons like Laz cannons do nothing against them. This supports big tanky monsters, and the faction has a heavy emphasis on greater demons, which are huge, incredibly strong, and customizable characters that embody the playstyle of their patron gods and also buff nearby allegiant demons. Chaos Space Marines are more of the mortal servants of of each of these chaos gods. They are basically space marines, but with more spikes and also usually worse, unfortunately. Chaos Space Marine sub-factions are organized into legions that get a bunch of unique abilities, similar to space marine chapters that we'll cover later. These legions are separate and less unique from the three other varieties of alignment-specific chaos space marines that we'll cover next, those being Death Guard, Thousand Sons, and World Eaters. Legions are also able to take allied groups of demons based on their allegiance. Most legions can take undivided allies, but some, like the Emperor's Children Legion are locked to a specific god, in that case, Lanesh. This also goes for the alignment specific codexes I'll talk about later. However, this codex itself uses the wanton destruction mechanic to benefit different weapon types as the game progresses with exploding attack, and typically focuses on powerful, demonically infused characters, backing up super survivable tank units of heavy infantry like possessed.
Possessed, or Chaos Terminators. This kind of theme is carried on with the Death Guard, the Nurgle-aligned Chaos Space Marines that are all about getting down with the sickness. Oh. They're very slow, but ridiculously tanky, with high invulnerable saves, damage reduction, and damage ignore rolls available almost everywhere in the faction, and project unique contagion auras from their units that debuff enemy models and grow in size as the game goes on. The army has solid long-range shooting and anti-charge effects, altogether making them one of the most difficult armies to deal with once you get up close and personal. Thousand Sons are these Zinch-focused Chaos Space Marines that look like they just walked out of the nearest Chapa Eye. This army has an excellent psychic phase, probably the number one psychic army in the game, since all of their units have unit champion sorcerers that are psychers themselves and are able to cast most of their support spells. And all of their psychers are HQs as well. Each of these psychers cooperate to generate a pool of Kabbalistic ritual points that the army can use to fuel its powers with extra effects and reliability, taking control of the normally fickle psychic phase. The army has slow units, but lots of repositional and teleport effects to move them around the table, and they shoot decently well at close to medium range, and tank reasonably well with good and vulnerable saves, especially ones buffed by their psychic powers. World Eaters is the newest codex for 40k. They are corn focused Chaos Space Marines who never skip a visit to the gym. Honestly, it's really inspiring. They're able to be taken in two sub-factions, either normal World Eaters Marines or a Demon and World Eaters hybrid army led by their Primarch Angron. They're probably the most aggressive army in the game next to Orcs, almost entirely reliant on Alpha striking their opponent in melee, and basically have literally no other game plan. This aggression is further incentivized by the Blood Tithe point mechanic, which allows the army to fuel their melee attacks with buffs purchased by using Blood Tithe points that they generate any time any unit from either side is destroyed, which apply permanently and can buff their future attacks. As both armies are slaughtered in a glorious bloodbath, the World Eaters army will get more and more powerful until their smaller units are hitting as hard as a freight train. Chaos Knights are uh, basically Imperial Knights. We'll talk about them later once we get to Armies of the Imperium, but these ones are much spikier. They're a faction entirely built around giant combat walkers, titans and other smaller vehicles called war dogs, and have no non-vehicle options in the entire codex. In fact, the smallest unit in the army is the equivalent to most armies' main battle tanks. Chaos Knights specifically mess with enemy morale and game actions using leadership manipulation effects, unlocked by their unique Harbingers of Dread ability that lets them unlock new abilities as the game goes on along a specific path. They can upgrade their vehicles with Favors of the Dark Gods to grant them special abilities that are enhanced as they destroy enemy models. Altogether, the faction is much less tanky than their Imperial counterparts, but function much trickier, although they have access to many of the same units. Now, last but not least, we'll talk about the quote-unquote good guys of the 41st millennium. Not that there really is one, but at least these are the POV of the faction that most of the fluff is based around. These are the armies of the Imperium. Now, similar to Chaos, Imperium is a huge super faction, the largest in the game, and it's difficult to pin down specifically one strength that they have together. If I were to choose one, it would be be that they tend to rely on slower and more heavily armored units than the units of other factions in the game. There's not a lot of movement tricks within the Imperium, but there are a lot of ranged attacks and options to increase your resiliency. So Imperium armies tend to be relatively slow, but that isn't the case for all of them. And again, they have a lot of options between their dozens of, of potential sub-factions. Before we dive into each codex in specific, I wanna give a shout out to Imperial Agents. These are a handful of toolbox characters and other units that can be included in any Imperium detachment, including Inquisitors that unlock unique psychic powers and Assassins who are powerful damage dealing and disruption characters. There's a handful of other generic Imperial units like Naval Infantry that are are also available, but are rarely better than just taking more of your core faction units. Now diving into the codexes proper, we're starting with the Adeptus Sororitas, bondage nuns complete with giant boobs glued onto the front of their power armor. This faction uses a unique miracle dice mechanic to bank rolls for later use after performing particularly pious acts, giving them the ability to remove a lot of randomness from the game. This gives them long threat ranges and the ability to hit way above their weight class, but at the cost of being a generally squishy faction, relying on a lot of toughness three models with decent and vulnerable saves, but sometimes questionable armor. 
Adeptosaur Rotas have a lot of excellent defensive play with good passive secondary objectives that let them hunker down in their shrines and play defensively, then punish enemies for getting too close with lethal close range firepower and melee attacks. They also have a little bit of a focus on special characters with some cross sub faction special characters like Celestine and the Gemini Superior, Morvin Vol, and Ephriel Stern and Kaiganil being incredibly strong individual combatants that almost every Adeptus Rotas army can take advantage of. The Adeptus Custodes are the Emperor's personal bodyguards and the largest importer of spray tan in the entire galaxy. The faction is composed of hyper elite heavy infantry with a around the most expensive cost per wound of anything in the game, but are protected by layers of insane defensive stats and abilities to be super tanky. This is offset a little bit by the inclusion of Sisters of Silence that can add some much needed utility and psychic defense to Custodes detachments, but at the cost of not being very survivable or doing much damage. Overall, the faction has decent mid-range shooting, but excellent control of the fight phase with powerful melee stats on every single unit and lots of reactive stratagems that can dictate the order of their opponent's fights. They also use a unique kata mechanic that gives the army modal abilities that are set out before the game and have multiple optional effects you can choose from from turn to turn, similar to Necron's command protocols. The Adeptus Mechanicus are machine men from Mars. They're appropriate for basically being computer people that can speak only binary, given that armies of the Adeptus Mechanicus just seek to bring the most efficient gun lines and damage output in the game and truly beat their opponents with pure math alone. The army is widely criticized for having the most complex command phase of any faction, with basically every character and many other unit champions having access to multiple stackable buffs that can supercharge their units to hit much higher than their weight class. These units are split between the proper tech priests of the cult Mechanicus and their weird experiments, and the Skitari, who are the regular army of cyborg soldiers. The tech priests themselves benefit from Canticles of the Omnisaya, giving them a selection of once per game abilities, whereas the Skitari gain Doctrina Imperatives that grant stat buffs for a temporary debuff to another stat. Overall, this creates a flexible, relatively well-rounded army with extremely good shooting and decent melee damage depending on how they're built, but no psychers to speak of at all although it should be noted that Imperial agents can shore up this deficiency. The Astra Militarum are the regular army of the Imperium. They're normal military guys who still haven't realized that World War II's been over for like a really long time. Unlike other armies that use a selection of specific sub-factions to compose their detachments, Astra Militarum allows you to take a selection of unique units from a variety of backgrounds all in the same army, which then benefit from a set of regimental abilities that you choose upon list construction, giving them some of the most flexible list building out of any army in the game. This army is filled with cheap, hyper-efficient units that are supercharged with aura abilities and command phase effects called orders. This gives them a combination of cheap, fast infantry who can hold objectives alongside powerful main battle tanks and some of the game's best artillery units. They also have a selection of specialist ground troops like Kazurkin or Attilan Rough Riders that already have solid offensive stats and can be buffed with orders to hit well above their weight class. Imperial Knights are the other half of Chaos Knights, a faction entirely made up of big stompy battle robots, including big Titanic Knight varieties alongside smaller Armager Walkers. This faction tends to focus on tankiness and range damage output in stark contrast to Chaos Knights. They have unique Bondsman abilities that their larger knights can grant to their Armager Walkers, which typically give them rerolls and other support effects, but also make them dramatically more difficult to kill. This is compounded by the Code Chivalric, which instructs an Imperial Knight's army to swear a number of oaths when you construct your list. These oaths will level up as you continue to fulfill them. However, any failure to do so will lose you honor points and potentially give your army debuffs instead. Moving on to the other Knight faction in the Imperial Super Faction, Let's talk about Grey Knights. These are technically a Space Marine chapter, but don't use any of the Space Marine mechanics. They're literal knights in shining armor who fight demons and get a lot of bonuses to do so. Almost literally every unit in the army is a Psyker. This puts them in contention for one of the best psychic faces in the game, but they don't have many buffs to cast and many of their psychic powers are inconsistent, meaning that while they can have some very strong psychic combos, they have very few ways of actually getting them off. Instead, they use extreme mobility granted by their teleporters and the ability to move around the table very quickly alongside decent melee, especially from their line infantry like interceptors and strike squads, all of whom have powerful Nemesis Force Weapons, and solid shooting from larger walkers like Nemesis Dread Knights. These are further buffed by the unique Tides of the Warp mechanic that give their Psyker units access to increased survivability, range, or melee damage output, which can be swapped out by casting a spell. Now, speaking of Space Marines, let's move on to Space Marines 
proper, the power armored poster boys of Warhammer 40k. If you've seen basically any piece of 40k marketing, you probably know what a space marine looks like, and the faction is one of the largest in the game. Today, I'm gonna to be covering each sub-faction within the Codex proper. Each of them operates pretty independently from one another, and they all have their own supplemental materials, but there are also non-compliant chapters, which have printed supplement books that are used alongside the Codex and include unique special units for specific chapters, like Black Templars, Death Watch, or Blood Angels. The faction as a whole has a unique combat doctrine mechanic that gives stat buffs to various weapon types depending on the round number, typically starting with your longer range weapons moving to medium range weapons in round two and close range weapons further on in the game. Each sub-faction or chapter in the army also gets an additional bonus if your entire army is made up of that chapter and you are using that chapter's favorite doctrine. Overall, the army is composed of resilient jack-of-all-trade units that are generally decent at both melee and shooting and rely on overlapping character buffs to supercharge their units. They have a very flexible game plan, especially with each chapter having unique abilities and able to specialize in a particular arena of warfare, and have a very wide stable of playable units, with the longest list of data sheets of any army in the game. So with that, let's move on to each individual chapter, starting with Black Templars. Nobody told these guys their crusades were done like a, a really long time ago, so they're real stuck in the past. They can't take psychers, so they instead focus on buffing units with chaplains, spiritual leaders instead, and are focused mostly on melee infantry, alongside being kind of tanky and tricksy in the fight phase. They can customize their individual unit leaders with unique stratagems and relic bearer upgrades, giving them everything from improved survivability to enhanced damage, and are one of the most annoying armies in the game to actually steal objectives from. The Blood Angels are space vampires that even sparkle in the sunlight and paint their armor red. They also have a ton of melee damage buffs and focus almost entirely on jump back infantry in attacking out of Deep Strike, with lots of abilities to enhance their threat range and huge buffs in melee, especially once the Assault Doctrine becomes active. Imperial Fists and Crimson Fists, a successor of the Imperial Fist chapter, or I guess in some cases, blue painted boys that get benefits to blowing up vehicles and also shooting bolt guns and other bolt weapons. Overall, the design of this faction is a little bit confused, but generally speaking, they focus on ranged firepower. Iron Hands, on the other hand, are a vehicle focus chapter that brings a lot of straightforward synergies, like invulnerable saves, flat bonuses to hit or armor saves, which makes them good at buffing a variety of units, but mostly focus on vehicles and especially dreadnoughts with whom they have special synergy. Iron Hands are almost entirely focused on bringing heavy weapons and include some immense buffs for those heavy weapons, making them an incredibly easy army to build for. As long as your weapon has the heavy type, you're probably doing it right. Raven Guard are disenfranchised Green Day fans that are supposed to be covert operatives, but mostly just rely on forward deploying and reserve mechanics to deliver often unstoppable alpha strikes if they go first and have a bad time if they go second. They have some ways to increase their threat ranges, but don't do it as well as other chapters like Blood Angels or White Scars. And they're also very good at killing big characters and assassinating enemy leadership. Salamanders are a solid all-rounder army focused on dealing absolutely ludicrous damage, mostly in melee or with close to medium range weapons, especially melta-guns and flamers, with which they have special synergies. They're also pretty good defensively and have some defensive buffs alongside cool reactive stratagems, like the ability of their units to protect one another against ranged attacks or charges. White Scars, on the other hand, are super fast and aggressive melee specialists that can duck in and out of combat and deal ridiculous damage once all their buffs are active in the Assault Doctrine. They also have some of the longest threat ranges in the game of any marine chapter, able to advance and charge across the entirety of their army and stack tons of buffs both to their advance and charge rolls, allowing them to double dip on a lot of movement enhancing effects. Ultramarines are everyone's kind of boring cousin who ran away from home at an early age to join the Blue Man Group. These are kind of a jack of all trades army with lots of powerful special characters that tend to assemble a combination of a slow, relatively defensively oriented brick. They oftentimes focus on ranged attacks backed up by those characters to anchor them in the late game. Space Wolves, on the other hand, are a highly technical melee-focused chapter that specializes in receiving charges and fighting on their own terms. They include a lot of defensively oriented charge in fight phase manipulation and can customize their units even in excess of what many other chapters can by including special wolf guard unit leaders in addition to their unit sergeants. This gives them a lot of flexibility when it comes to building their individual units and can use that to focus both on ranged attacks and melee and have some solid buffs for both. Dark Angels are a bit of a weird sub-faction that in itself is broken up into three uh, sub-sub-factions, I guess. 
These being the Deathwing, which are ridiculously resilient Terminators that get enormous defensive buffs, not only from their inner circle ability, meaning that they can only be wounded on rolls of a 4+, but also a lot of relics and other effects that can stack defensive benefits on them. Ravenwing are ridiculously fast bikers who get enhanced movement and can deliver punishing range strikes and uh, everyone else, which the community has dubbed the Green Wing, who provide the chapter with the tools to be a relatively above average gun line, and can also sometimes shoot while in melee, which is kind of cool. This makes Dark Angels one of the most flexible and certainly powerful Space Marine chapters, especially when they're able to combine the resilience of the Deathwing Terminators with the speed and flexibility of the Ravenwing. They also might be a Chaos Legion too, if everyone in every video comment section about Dark Angels is to be believed. And last, but certainly not least, in our odyssey through the 41st millennium, the Death Watch are another weird chapter in that they interact with the Space Marine doctrine mechanics and even data sheets much differently than everyone else. Death Watch are able to pick which doctrine they benefit from each round instead of progressing through them sequentially, but in doing so lose access to any sort of super doctrine ability, so they don't get enhanced bonuses for being in a particular doctrine. They also have the unique ability to build kill team units out of infantry or bikers that share the same armor marks, meaning that they can field units combining a bunch of different heavy Gravis infantry or lightly armored Phobos Recon Specialists, for example. This allows them to build a lot of unique infantry units, but kind of eschews focus on vehicles or other unit types, and makes them extremely flexible, if not particularly powerful, especially when dealing with enemy heavy armor. That said, Death Watch do tend to use a lot of teleportation technology and unique Xenos trickery to make them relatively mobile, and able to adopt a wide variety of game plans. And with that, that's every army in Warhammer 40k. Let me know down in the comments which one you are most excited to play, or if you do play, which one your favorite is to play on the tabletop. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks as well to not only Voxlink for supporting the video, but also either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tortoise, YouTube channel memberships, and Twitch subscribers. All you people are great. You help me keep these lights on, and I really appreciate you. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.